Colorado scales back its testing goals, and the governor outlines a plan to reach those new lower goals next month. We'll take another look at why testing is so crucial, even if most people with COVID-19 will be fine. The hunt for volunteers to help Colorado expand telehealth. We look at whether election day could be delayed, and who could do it. We'll solve a mystery from deep inside my basement. The trippy reason that March dragged and April seemed to fly. Speaking of, we return to Colorado's hottest love triangle. Finally, something that has nothing to do with the pandemic. That's next. Colorado's big announcement on COVID-19 testing today was actually somewhat of a, a subtle rollback of the state's stated testing goals and an admission that we're unlikely to have the testing supplies to test at the state's full capacity anytime next month. 10,000 tests a day have been Colorado's goals as recently as yesterday, and that's the state's capacity for processing these tests if we have the necessary supplies. Today, Governor Jared Hickenlooper said that we're going to aim for 5,000 tests in early May and up to 8,500 tests by later in the month. That would bring us in line with what some national public health experts are recommending in terms of a testing rate. I did ask the governor today if he has looked at why Utah and New Mexico have managed to outpace us on testing rates and whether he's talked to those governors to find out why they're succeeding. I talk regularly with the governors of our neighboring states. Uh, it's very relevant, in fact, uh, what Utah, Wyoming, New Mexico, uh, Arizona, Nebraska, Kansas are all working on, Oklahoma, uh, uh, are all doing great work in different areas. Uh, many of them uh, didn't, uh, had a, di didn't have to have the same kind of stay-at-home period that we did. Uh, and that's, that's just the fact that they had less of an outbreak than we did. Colorado has always been kind of just south of being one of these national hotspots. The governor's spokesman told me late this evening that if 10,000 tests a day are needed in June, then the state will be ready at that point. Also today, the governor used some of his strongest language yet on the issue of evictions. We were talking about that here last night. He said today that he was going to extend and strengthen his executive order on evictions, and the governor stated point blank that there will be no evictions for late payment in the month of May. 766 Coloradans are known to have died from COVID-19. 82 of our neighbors did get to go to home from the hospital in the last day. The 782 current hospitalizations is about holding steady as those folks are replaced by new cases coming in. Almost 70,000 Coloradans have been tested since the pandemic began. In a perfect world, again, we would be doing 70,000 tests in a week. So let's return to why testing is so important. I mean, if most folks who test positive are just going to be sent home to ride out the virus, why test so many people and do that testing for so long? Our Steve Steger got a refresher from an infectious disease expert. Testing is important, and the reasoning is rather simple. From an epidemiologic standpoint, we want to understand who's had the disease. Um, and by doing that, that allows us to know how far along are we in terms of this pandemic. Infectious disease specialist Dr. Michelle Barron says the results of testing allow health officials to do contact tracing. If someone's positive, you check in with people they've had close contact with and test them too. Once you've figured out where all the contacts that are positive, you can isolate them because they may not be sick yet. It keeps the virus out of the open and allows us to open more of the economy seems simple enough, but the truth is we are way behind. Colorado is currently doing at most about 3,000 tests per day. One study from Harvard found our state needs more than five times that each day to catch up. Like if you had 2 million people and you're doing 2,000 tests, that's a long, a long time course to be able to test everyone. And in that time frame, you're not able to do anything about it. So if it's delayed by 20 days or 30 days, that's 30 days that you could have potentially put someone in isolation and avoided them spreading it unknowingly. Barron says we need more testing sooner rather than later so we can get a good look at this invisible enemy that will be here for a while. This is because we're trying to like do this quickly and efficiently and get it done so that we know. 
And the more we test, the more we know about the virus that causes COVID-19. Barron says one of the things we could learn from more advanced testing is how much this virus is spread asymptomatically before you even start to notice the signs of symptoms. Positive tests would allow you to go back and try to figure some of that out through contract tracing, Kyle. And see, we hear people's frustration saying, well, why is the guidance changing? Why is the advice or the, the, the benchmarks changing? And again, this is a novel coronavirus. This is our first go round. So the, the experts are learning. Yeah, the secret is there's so much that is unknown about this that the more you test, the more data you can collect, the more information you have so that you can set new standards down the road. Steve Steger, thank you so much. Colorado's job losses over the last five weeks have been equivalent to the last three years combined. We're going to get confirmation of exact numbers tomorrow when those are released. But we know that about 350,000 of our neighbors are out of work right now. Researchers at CU's Lead School of Business do think that there's going to be job growth from July to September as businesses reopen, although the outlook is not calling for every single job to come back. We consider one of our more likely scenarios right now with some sort of W-shaped recovery where things get better this summer and this fall and then get a little bit worse again this winter as the, the virus comes back. We do think that a three-year timeline to recover job losses could, could be feasible. We expect to see a spike in tomorrow's unemployment numbers, and those are from gig workers and from independent contractors who lost their work some time ago, but the state is just now figuring out how to process them in the system. Big city school districts are trying to get in on the action from the coronavirus aid packages that keep coming out of Congress. The so-called Council of Great Schools sent a letter to Congress asking for $175 billion in educational fund, as well as billions more for disability education and emergency infrastructure funds. 61 big city superintendents signed on to this request, including DPS's Susana Cordova. DPS figures it'll lose 32.31, or excuse me, $13.2 million in funding this year. So we've been telling you throughout the pandemic to use telehealth to talk to your doctor. And I know that some of your doctors are like, tele what? Just come into the office. Colorado is now making an urgent request for more doctors to volunteer to do telemedicine appointments. Here's Anusha Roy. It seems like a lot of people have been listening. If you would have asked me this three months ago, I would have told you that probably 80 to 90% of the patients that we see, we're seeing in a face-to-face -face environment, right? In a clinic, in the usual setting. And pretty much within a couple of weeks, we flip that. At Kaiser, more patients are calling and video chatting with their doctors and nurses instead of showing up in person. I think it's a bit of a win-win. But still, the state has an urgent ask. They need more health care professionals to donate their time to provide free telehealth visits. The state is trying to do is make it as easy as possible. Jeff Bontrager with the Colorado Health Institute has been studying the state's policy. Getting to the point we're at now has not been easy. Not all doctors' offices have the tech to support telemedicine right away. And while many insurance companies cover telehealth, if you have to pay out of pocket, depends on what kind of insurance you have and what you called your doctor for. Meanwhile, Coloradans have been rapidly losing their jobs along with their insurance. So Bontrager said this might be the state's way of trying to catch people falling through the gaps while respecting those on the front lines when in general have been asking for volunteers. They're trying to get people who may be retired, like retired doctors, or uh, people who are um, whose licenses are inactive for some reason, maybe they're teaching as opposed to practicing, um, or again, out of state uh, clinicians. There's a mission mindset. There is a feeling of a higher calling that people are willing to go above and beyond and help in any way they can. So we asked the state, why are they making this ask? How many people are they looking for? And they said that they weren't going to be able to get back to us in time for our story today. They did, however, refer us back to their own website where it has the details on how to volunteer and as well as like some tips on insurance, Kyle. And one thing we do want to remind people is that for a lot of you, that if you do a telehealth call related to COVID-19, it's going to be absolutely free right now. And Nusha, in terms of getting doctors into this system, uh, the struggle is real, but the struggle is not new. 
No, it's absolutely not. And it's been really interesting because there is an issue that we brought up before on this show that not everybody has good enough internet to support telehealth. And over the last couple of weeks, the state has actually expanded to allow people to just to include a normal phone call. So now the question becomes, do these changes stick around? Is it permanent? Have we changed the way we're getting health care beyond this pandemic? Mm -hmm. All right, Anusha Roy, thank you. You ever think to yourself, before all the pandemic stuff, what did we used to talk about? The big headline on Next one year ago today was the G-Line finally opening. Shiny and new and only two years behind schedule with a robot announcer voice on the trains that could not say Wheat Ridge. <laughs> this is the G-Line to Wheat Ridge, Ward Station. The G-Line still today connects downtown with Wheaton Ridge and Arvada, a beautiful train to some great spots in our state that will be looking for us to come spend our dollars once again when the coast is clear. Speaking of waiting, that reminds me of our all-time favorite RTD ghost train. You have to bear with me because the home graphics department is not quite as advanced as the one at the station. But uh, yes, only... 10,839 days until Longmont gets its long-promised RTD train in 2050. You didn't think I threw that out, did you? Here's the deal, though. All joking aside, well, it's going to go that way. RTD's workers, the rank-and-file folks, the uh, train operators, the, the bus drivers, they are doing a great job through all of this. They are out there in the thick of it every single day, getting people who need to go somewhere where they need to go. We appreciate the work that they do today, tomorrow, all the way through 2050. Time is a flat circle, or so I was told. A smart person explains how quarantine is warping our sense of time. And Colorado's red hot love triangle rages on for another season. Not even the pandemic can stop the drama on Nest. I made one of my all-time verbal flubs on this program when I referred to our governor as Jared Hickenlooper. Of course, the governor would be Jared Polis. John Hickenlooper would be the former governor. I was thinking maybe none of you would notice, and the only people who wrote in to tell me that I had messed up were Rick, Tom, Lana, Nick, Craig, Tack, Lisa, Bond, Jen, Kelly, Hannah, Diane, Pam, Bruce, Peggy, Roberto, Mark, Nola, Amanda, Marie, Gino, Terry, Jonathan, Carrie, Beth, Cecilia, Jay, Tim, Susan, Mary, and David. Today's next question comes from Lisa. Not the first time we've heard someone ask if President Trump can postpone the general election or if Congress has to get involved. A short answer here, President Trump cannot just push back Election Day if he finds it to be politically inconvenient. This year's election set for Tuesday, November 3rd. Only Congress can change that. Even the presumptive Democratic nominee, Joe Biden, speculated about the president delaying the election. Here's why he can't do it alone. NBC News did a deep dive on this. The date of the general election has been fixed for the past 175 years. A few local elections have been disrupted, one after 9-11, another after a hurricane. And there was talk about postponing the 2004 presidential election. The Bush administration was worried about terrorism. But Condoleezza Rice, Bush's national security advisor at the time, said elections had always gone on, even in war times and the 2004 election was held as scheduled. This Congress, with Democrats running the House, is unlikely to push back Election Day even if President Trump wants to. And even if both houses of Congress were to vote to change an Election Day and the President sign that legislation, their options are limited. The new Congress has to be sworn in on January 3rd, and the President's new term must begin January 20th. Those dates cannot be changed. The real power to mess with elections comes on the state level. Each state largely sets its own rules. That's why Colorado's had mail-in voting since 2013, and other states don't have it at all. So March seemed to last a while, right? And then April just kind of flew by. A bunch of you said something to us about that. Dr. Max Wachtel, on retainer to examine the contents of my brain and yours, says there is a scientific and simple reason. In new or novel situations, especially in stressful situations, our, our brains actually encode more information. So like, it, like computers encode and take in information, our brains do that too. Once we get through March, we aren't bombarded by all of this brand new information. Um, 
we've started to develop a routine. So then we move into April. We kind of get used to working from home or helping the kids out with school from home, um, taking the dog on five walks a day, you know, whatever our new routine is that feels a lot more normal. Uh, so our brains go back to just encoding the, the same amount of information as usual and time kind of speeds up the way that it normally does. So March, super slow month. Our brains were just getting bombarded with all this extra information. April, things kind of go back to normal and it feels like, like time is going by like that. Do not be freaked out if next month seems to drag just like March did. Dr. Max says he thinks that May is going to feel slower to us as well as we adjust to a new schedule, new way of living life. She's been through life, loss, a great recession, now COVID-19. She has her worries, sure, but I really think you're going to find her perspective refreshing. There's a new woman in town, and she's making her move on Colorado's most watched bird. That's Nest. A lot of small business owners have it rough right now. But you know, a lot of them have had it rough before. Dawn Abbott is one. She shared her perspective with our photojournalist, Mike Grady. Yeah, yeah, really quiet. Yeah, really quiet. I'm Dawn Abbott, uh, started Fun Productions in 1991. It is an amusement rental company. We started a company just kind of as a side hustle after having then two children, you know, just got busy. It was just, we were doing so much. So then in May of 2013, our daughter was born. And then in August of that year, Tim, my husband, just a freak, tragic boating accident, um, we lost him. It was now, I'm, uh, you know, the single mother, widowed mother of a, of a newborn baby, and I'm running these businesses by myself. The company now, um, before COVID-19, was um, about 15 full-time regular employees and 100 plus kind of event staff. Nothing has ever been like a faucet stopped, <laughs> and that's what it was like. And this was the first time I had to, you know, stand in front of my entire team and say, y'all should file for unemployment. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart, um, you know, then to do it and, and every day. You know, I miss them. I miss their, their faces. I miss their energy. Losing the most important person in my life, my best friend and husband and business partner and father of my children. What you can do is say, okay, what am I grateful for? What can we do? When we come back, it's that people need to connect. They need to be together and they need to smile and they need to have fun and laugh. Agreed, 100%. So those much-watched eagles out at Stanley Lake, man, they've had kind of a hot and heavy thing going on for more than a year now, even though we're watching. It's a riveting telenovela that we have been following here on Nest. Here is the latest. Mama and Papa Eagle were chilling in their nest this season, watching over three eggs, and then earlier this month, a new woman came into the picture. And by that, I mean a female eagle attacked the nest. And the Stanley Lake Wildlife Manager's best guess is that Mama Eagle decided to leave home to recover somewhere else. Apparently, this is typical eagle behavior. Sadly, though, it means that those three eggs are not expected to hatch now. But wait, there's more. Papa Eagle is shacking up with the new Lady Eagle. Wildlife Manager out there has named her Eagle F420, female, April 2020. Eagles normally lay their eggs in late February, and then they hatch in late May or early June, so it is unlikely that this pair, for all of their very visible efforts in the nest, are going to produce eggs this year. Stanley Lakes Wildlife Manager said they get pretty attached to their eagles out there, but they said this is just how the wildlife world works. They wanted to make sure people didn't think that F420 is a nest wrecker. She's just looking to survive. We will solve a mystery and have your feedback next. Shailene wrote in from Loveland, curious about the spot on the wall behind me. Could you please fix the black caterpillar shaped line on the wall over your shoulder? It's driving my husband nuts and he is driving me nuts. I so wish I could fix it for you, Shailene. I can't. It's the old lever for the fireplace flu. It is stuck to the wall. There's a woman named Anne who tweets in every night about how I'm an agent of the deep state. Uh, but Anne wrote in tonight with her first ever positive comment that she loved when my poster fell down behind me. 
And I'm so glad because now Ann and I are connecting. Ann, I will see you next time.